and you're on the aeroplane for nine and a half days, and each of the aeroplanes didn't really operate at night. So every night you stayed ashore in a luxurious hotel and you got to experience a part of the world as you, or parts of the world, I should say, as you went uh, went along. So, you know, the, the trip was quite a different experience of travel than we have today. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, dear Damcasters. Welcome back to the show. And we've got a bit of a long one for you today. And it's going to be a two-parter as well, because when we start delving into the incredible Empire-class flying boats, there is so much to talk about, especially when we start delving into the route out to Australia and what is essentially these days, I suppose we call a code share with Qantas. When we think of these mythical beasts, we tend to think of incredible luxury, you know, smoking service, the whole nine yards, something that is beyond even the first class of the best airlines today. But the purpose of the Short Brothers S23, the Empire flying boat or the C-class, depending on how you know it, the focus of the aircraft was what was in the hold and not so much what was in the cabin. It's an area of history that I've always been fascinated with with and i've never really had the chance to delve into but thankfully on my trip to australia last year the lovely james kitely introduced me to phil vabre phil is the president of the civil aviation historical society down there and he also runs the superb airways museum at essendon airport just on the edge of melbourne which i to my shame was taken around by phil it was fantastic and i didn't record it so i'm just gonna have to go back to melbourne Phil, though, is the go-to chap for all things Qantas Flying Boat. And in the first part of our discussion, we're going to look at the specification around the Empire Flying Boats, the development of the aircraft, and the ports of coals that passengers would see as they worked their way from Southampton to Sydney. So, I opened our conversation by asking Phil about what sort of routes Imperial and Qantas were operating in the days before the Empire Flying Boat arrived on the scene. So Qantas it was established in 1920. Um, they're basically doing joyrides and charters and that sort of thing. And in 1921, the Australian government created the Civil Aviation Branch of the Department of Defence to regulate aviation. And one of the first things they did was issue tenders for airline licences. Uh, the first airline in Australia was in Western Australia. Uh, run, when the tender was won by West Australian Airways. And the other one was in Western Queensland, won by Qantas. Now, you might wonder why I set up an airline in Western Queensland. Most people know Qantas started in Western Queensland, but don't really know why it was there. Uh, and the, re the reason was that um, there were three railway lines that ran in from the coast into the outback but there was no connecting line that connected the railhead so if you wanted to go from say Charleville to Longreach you had to go all the way into the coast up the coast on the train and back out to Longreach or get on your horse and ride to the Longreach which took days and you know it's been tough conditions so Qantas was set up to connect the railheads basically out the middle of nowhere and they gradually expanded from there linking back to brisbane uh, on the coast capital of queensland and then um, in 1934 uh, australia set up its first international air service to meet the imperial airways service from britain so uh, imperial airways switching to the other side of the world now had started in the 20s they were expanding throughout the british empire the idea being to connect all the colonies britain of course was a worldwide you know, superpower in the, the 20s and 30s uh, with colonies everywhere as well who knew with the um, you know the pink bits on the map and all that uh, and there was a need for... Sun, sun never sets on the British Empire because it exactly. can't trust an Englishman in the dark, sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> that sort of thing. 
Um, <laughs> so from a, a number of different perspectives, from a defence perspective, a military perspective, from a commercial point of view, it was certain it was important to connect the colonies. In those days, uh, prior to the aeroplane, mail went by train where train lines existed and where they didn't usually buy a ship. And it was a pretty long, drawn-out process. So Imperial Airways was given the job of extending air routes out throughout the British Empire to connect all the, all the colonies. So they first extended, uh, well, the first air routes were set up in the Middle East to connect uh, Egypt, which was a rich colony back then, with Iraq. And then they sort of found out from there, Britain connected itself with Europe. And then uh, gradually the, the air routes pushed down from Egypt towards Africa and out towards India. By the early 30s, uh, Imperial Airways had moved in, in, in the Australia direction. They, they'd got down to South Africa and Af Africa was, was all connected in. And um, out to the east, they'd gone out to India initially, then across to Burma and then down to Malaya, uh, or Singapore was um, Malaya in those days. And the next step was to connect Australia and New Zealand into the, the Empire's air routes, and that's where Qantas came in in 1934. They, were, they won a contract. Uh, they are actually, the old Qantas formed a partnership with Imperial Airways called Qantas Empire Airways, uh, and that company won the tender to operate this new service. So the idea was um, Australia had produced a lot of well-known aviators after the First World War, and you know some of the great long-distance pioneering flights, people like Kingsford Smith and Minkler and so on and so forth. Uh, so Australians felt that they had a right to operate their routes in their own backyards. So the Australian government negotiated with the British government uh, that Australia would operate the section of the route to Singapore and Imperial Airways and Britain could do the rest. Um, as I said, uh, Qantas Empire Airways was actually a, a joint company between Qantas and uh, Imperial Airways anyway. Um, so 1934, they, December 1934, they kicked off the international service. Um, it really didn't amount to much at the start because the the H-86 aircraft that Qantas had bought, had designed really for them and had bought for that service, had uh, suffered a number of fatal accidents and been grounded. So um, Qantas used a couple of old biplanes from their previous inland service to, to run the, the international service for the first period and then uh, Imperial Airways flew through down to Darwin to collect the mail there. Uh, so it really wasn't a very auspicious start. But the behind the scenes, at exactly that time, Imperial Airways had come up with a, a much grander scheme for the future of the air, air mail service, and that became known as the Empire Air Mail Scheme. So they presented this idea to the British government uh, it took a while for things to percolate through, but, but there was the sort of genesis of the flying boat service. Because it's, it's mail that pushes this forward, not passengers, isn't it? Absolutely. So today we think of particularly the Empire flying boats as being luxurious passenger transport aircraft, but in fact their entire purpose was shifting the mail around the Empire. So, for example, the mail from Australia before the aircraft had taken about a month to get to Britain by boat. So you can imagine if you send a letter requiring a reply, you've got a month for it to get to Britain, a week or two maybe for it to a reply to be written, and then another month to be sent back to Australia. So you're looking at you know nearly three months for a, a turnaround on a letter, which you know today it was our modern communications. We just can't believe it would take that long, but that's why I didn't. So <clears throat> there were telegrams and things like that as well, of course, but, but they were very expensive uh, and only used if you really, really had to. 
And it, it's something we really do need to keep in mind is, it, you know, it's speed of communication, something we've become, like you said, really in need to, you know, we'd pick up our phones and a message, you know, us, us sitting here chatting on the other end of the world, looking at each other is, was sort of science fiction-y sort of things for them back then. When you, you just try to stay in touch with family, it's a couple of letters a year if you're lucky. That's right. You know, even for businesses, remember that you know, most white Australians then thought of Britain as the mother country and Australia was quite important in the economy of the empire and had a lot of, uh, you know, food stuffs and raw materials came from Australia. So if you were running a business, you know, you, you were ordering something from the UK or people in the UK ordering something from Australia, you know, <clears throat> taking months to get that sorted out. Um, very cumbersome process. Um, and obviously the aeroplane offered the potential to speed that up enormously. The first international service reduced the... 30 odd days by ship down to 11 and a half days. So you know, we still think 11 and a half days, I can get on an aeroplane and be in Britain in 24 hours now. Uh, 11 days just seemed like an, an unbelievably long time, but you know, it was extremely quick in the context of the, the time. Don't, I don't know, spending a couple of weeks meandering my way down to Australia after visiting you in the, <laughs> in the autumn, that 20 hour flight. I'm not too sure. That was that was the the direct one, which in theory was faster. But never mind. That, that's, I'm, that's. I'm not saying it was a, it's a comfortable 24 hours. <laughs> I'm just saying it's quicker than 11 days or 30 days. Before we get on to the aircraft itself, let, let's just talk about the Empire Airmail scheme because this was very much, I don't want to say ploy, but it was it was trying to get their hand Imperial trying to get their hands on a government contract to try to be profitable because it was never a very successful company, was it? And this was, you know, because of the, the clientele that was going to be flying in the costs of it. So what, what was the scheme? Because it was very much a, a grab for grab for cash really, wasn't it? In some ways it was, so I guess when you say they weren't successful, it depends on how you measure success. But it's true. I'm, I'm, a, I'm cynical. You, you know what I'm like. It, yeah. <laughs> I, I look at it and I'm like, uh, yeah. Well, it, that, that, that's, a, that's a CEO trying to stay in, stay in charge. It's true that uh, Imperial Airways, before this, before the Empire Email Scheme, was, was pretty much a shoestring operation in a lot of ways. They had a, a pretty motley fleet of all sorts of different aircraft, none of them particularly big or fast or modern. Um, they had huge overheads because they had people stationed all over the empire and they were only running their one or two services a week on a lot of the routes. And, uh, you know, it's just a hugely inefficient operation. But what you've got to keep coming back to is the fact that they were providing a mail service that was, you know, a third of the time of, of what had come before. So, you know, in that sense, it was quite important. Um, but the Empire Airmail Scheme was uh, conceived by Imperial Airways as a means of generating additional revenue that would enable them to buy a fleet, essentially to buy a fleet of bigger, faster, much more modern aeroplanes. And to finance that, uh, it, in those days, to send pre-Airmail Scheme days, you had to to send an airmail letter, you had to pay an extra charge called a surcharge. So um, if you sent your mail by sea, it cost you whatever it was. And if you wanted to send it by air, you had to pay an extra charge on top of that. So um, Imperial Airways reason that, uh, you know, pretty sort of basic economic theory, if you reduce the cost of the uh, sending a letter by airmail, in other words, by knocking off the surcharge, the volume of mail that was sent would increase to the point where it would finance these much larger, faster, bigger, more modern aircraft. So that was, and of course they were also being paid by the, the amount of mail that they shifted. So it was money in it in that sense as well. Um, so that, that was the sort of underpinning idea of the Empire ML scheme. And 
as it turned out, they were exactly right. The um, when it did come in, the volumes of airmail shifted around the empire just increased enormously. In fact, in 1938, they, they had a uh, you know at Christmas, of course, everyone wants to send greetings around the empire to family and so on. So the volume of mail increased in 1938. The whole system just about collapsed under the weight of the, the mail. Um, it was that much. So, you know, in that sense, it was a huge success. Uh, and it did, in fact, do what, what they, they proposed it would do. We'll come back to some of the interesting side effects of it in shaping aviation law, because there's, there's, a, there's a lot to go in there, because... Let's talk about the flying boat itself, because I, you know, the I guess the iconic two types of Imperial aircraft, the old HP forty two, famously said it had an inbuilt headwind and you know could fly backwards and all that that sort of business. But the flying boat and the what became the C class flying boat, the short S twenty three, is that iconic sort of nineteen thirties thing. You know, there's you watch Indiana Jones, they've got a, you know, a, fl a flying boat in it and things. It's, it's that age of travel where people think of that sort of thing. But what was the aircraft that shorts were required or bid upon the requirement to build that became the, the Empire Flying Boat? Well, the Empire Flying Boat, or the short S-23, to give it its uh, proper name, um, was built or designed in response to a specification by Imperial Airways. Um, people often think, well, especially these days, it's often said that British aeronautical manufacturing and or design and manufacturing practice in the late 30s was backward. But in fact, the Empire flying boat wasn't back and shorts weren't backward at all. Shorts had been one of the first companies in Britain to um, start working with Duralumin. Um, uh, I think just after the First World War. And they were the first company to build a, um, a stress skin monocoque uh, aircraft in Britain. So uh, made out of aluminium. So they were technically advanced. They'd been building uh, flying boats for many years by the time we get to the late 30s. And they had done a lot of primary research work. Arthur Gouge, who became the chief designer at Shorts, had done a lot of experimental work using their own uh, test tank on hydrodynamic problems with flying boats. And he was able to apply the lessons that he'd learned there in the design of the um, Empire flying boat. So it was technically a quite advanced aircraft. Although, in terms of its aerodynamics, it was an incremental design um, based uh, on a scaling up of the short Scion Senior, which there was an earlier design. It was twice the size of that aircraft. The Scion Senior had a traditional kind of steel tube and wood construction. It was a, it was a land plane as well. Um, but the basic... Uh, shape of that, particularly the wing, was scaled up for the Empire Flying Boat, and the, but the Empire Flying Boat applied the stress skin construction that they'd been working with for many years as well. So it was a convergence of a number of technologies, but that sort of incremental design meant that they could iron out the handling and stability and so on issues of the, the aerodynamic shape We're using the Scion Senior. And they actually, uh, Imperial Airways awarded the Empire flying boats off the drawing board. There was no prototype uh, for testing or anything like that. The first aircraft was a production aircraft. So they took a huge risk in some ways, but because of the way it had been evolved, um, it really wasn't as big a risk as it might have seemed. And as it turned out, the aeroplane flew very well, it was very highly regarded um, by its crews. Uh, and it had a lot of advanced uh, features. It had uh, good radio equipment. It had a direction finder for navigation and uh, things like that. It had modern engines, had variable pitch propellers, which you know, weren't all that common at that time. 
Um, and as I said, the structurally and aerodynamically it was quite advanced as well. So it's we're talking about something which is cutting edge because people will yeah you know, you know, fire up Wikipedia and look at look at the cruising speed of 160, 170 miles an hour and think, oh that's yeah, you know, that's not fast, therefore it's not advanced. But what you really have is a long range cargo aircraft, isn't it? Because it's well, it's not got that many passengers. It's carrying a huge amount of mail for the time. Yeah, well, actually, it wasn't even that long a range. So in any aeroplane, and it's still a thing that holds true today, was a, a trade-off in design between payload range and speed. So the, far, the further you want to go, the, the less payload you can carry. It's pretty obvious. The more power you need to carry it, the more fuel you burn to carry it. Um, so to understand the design of the S23, you've, you've got to really always keep in mind it was designed to shift mail. So we think of it as, as I said before, as a luxurious passenger transport. But it really was designed to shift a lot of mail around the empire and the passengers were just the cream on top of that for Imperial Airways. So the primary financing of all of this was from the mail. Um, so the, as a consequence of that, they, the aeroplanes were designed to have a relatively short range and they had operational legs of about 500 miles. It was, it was a typical sort of leg. So really not that long, a couple of hours, three hours, something like that. They weren't that fast. They were faster than the aircraft that had come before in Australia, which was the DH-89, for example, but only by about 10 or 15 knots, they weren't much faster. They were a bit slower than a DC-3, but not hugely slower. And the other thing is they were designed to do it economically. Because obviously the bigger the aircraft, the more powerful the engines, the more fuel you're burning, the more it costs. The faster you go, the more it costs. So there's always that uh, balance of economics and um this is also a feature that you see in British aircraft design. I mean, that's why the HP-42 is what it was, for example. It was designed to get in and out of small airfields with a good load and do it all fairly economically. It didn't go very fast, but that's the price you pay, particularly you know, when that was designed. So that's, that's how or why the, the Empire flying boat is the way it was. In terms of passenger load, it was designed to carry 26 passengers, but in practice only ran it with 23 seats. And then fairly soon after it ended service, they removed uh, six of those seats. So they transformed because the mail loads were so high, the forward cabin had to be turned over to carrying mail because the contract specified that they had to take the mail no matter what. And then passengers got put on last so completely the opposite of how we run an airline today back in the day i have left passengers behind to put mail on <laughs> oh have you ever right well, there you go so maybe not <laughs> um but so anyway they <clears throat> after the first little bit of time uh they they were used with 17 seats only from imperial airways and Qantas's point of view they are being paid to ship the mail and mail is where the the money was to run the service and then any passengers that they could carry and this is this is the way their contracts are written any passengers that they carried was was profit to them basically but they had to take whatever mail was offering so they weren't allowed to offload passengers for mail um, 17 seats doesn't sound like a very big airplane these days but when you go back and look at it in the context of the time for example the dh-89 that Qantas was using before the Empire Flying Boats, over the Timor Sea on the international part of the service, uh, because of the, the Timor Sea crossing. Uh, so from Darwin to Singapore, they only carried seven passengers. So the uh, Empire Flying Boats more than doubled the number of seats available. So when you think about it in, in that sense, you can see it was a big step forward. And in fact, you know, people were worried that, you know, with these big aeroplanes, would we be able to fill them? But of course, they were. 
So big hold, stress skin, so very modern type of design. Inside, though, we, we keep saying luxury. It really was. As, as someone who is about to cram himself into an economy seat to, <laughs> to fly into the States, it's a very different experience for, I would guess, your hoi polloi, your civil servants, you, the people that will be using this service. They're going to expect a level of quality that is mind boggling to us today, isn't it? Because it's, it's not the most comfortable of flights flying around at what we would consider quite low level, but they're going to get taken care of along the way. Yeah, that's true. Um, and Imperial Airways and Qantas both aim to provide first class service. And given the price of a ticket in those days, you would expect that to hit money because a ticket to London cost a year's salary for the average person in Australia back in the 30s. So you're paying a year's salary for an air ticket. You'd want to get a pretty good treatment. The other thing is, even with the Empire Flying Birds, it reduced the service time a little bit. It was nine and a half days from Sydney through to uh, Southampton. But if you're on an aeroplane for nine and a half days, you're going to want some level of decent comfort as well. They made, as I said, they made quite a big effort to to make the airplanes comfortable for passengers. The seats were specially designed and uh, by Rumbolds, which is a famous company of sort of furniture makers. I think uh, they had um, aluminium frames, uh, nice upholstery, and they could recline not quite to lie flat standards, but almost uh, to lie flat so you could definitely have a good snooze in the, the seat so they're they pretty highly regarded as, as being comfortable um, and when you think about the competition which on the run out to Australia was KLM and KNILM using DC3s and Lockheed 14s their flying time was only about half a day less for the trip but uh, you cramped into a DC3 for those nine and a half days. So if you think about it from that point of view, which one would you rather go? And I think I'd be much more inclined to go in the Empire flight boat. And of course, the DC-3 had the same operational limitations, couldn't go any higher. The other thing with the Empire flying boats, and one of the, the features that a lot of people remark on, the rear cabin, not, not the back cabin, which was a, a smoking cabin, so it had a separate cabinet for smokers. Of course, a lot more smokers then than there are today. But the cabin in front of that had, it was called the promenade cabin because on the starboard side, the windows, you had the seats and the windows were set up. So you could look out the window, sort of normal seated height. But on the left-hand side of the cabin, there were no seats along the side. And there was instead a handrail along the cabin wall and special windows that were in a, uh, positioned higher up on the fuselage and larger so that you could stand there and look out the window and watch the world go by as you flew along. And because they were operating at much lower levels in those days, they're unpressurised, uh, you could actually see a decent bit of the world as you went past. And, of course, if you're doing that for nine days, there's plenty of time to stand around. But also it meant you could get up and walk around and stretch your legs and all of that, which... You know, if you're in the competitions aeroplane, you probably really couldn't do any of it. Because there's the stories of people on the Africa route with the aircraft dropping down to, to look at animals and things as they go along. So it's, it is a really different experience than, you know, blasting along at 37,000 feet and hoping that somebody can come by to give you some water at some point. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, one of the, the big things is that we kind of forget about now in our age of pressurised aluminium tubes is that in those days the trip was as much about the journey itself as it was about where you were going. Now we get in the aeroplane, we don't, you know, the trip's an embuggerance. It's about, you know, getting to the other end as quickly as possible to do whatever you're doing there as the objective. But in those days, the actual journey itself was was a major undertaking and it was a major adventure because you could see a lot more it took a lot longer of course um and we haven't really talked about it but you know you're on the airplane for nine and a half days 
and each of the aeroplanes didn't really operate at night. So every night you stayed ashore in a luxurious hotel and you got to experience a part of the world as you, or parts of the world, I should say, as you went uh, went along. So, you know, the, the trip was quite a different experience of travel than we have today. Why was it called the C-Class? <laughs> uh, I've called the C-Class because Imperial Airways named all their aircraft and they gave them, like with ships, they gave them class names and the Empire Flying Boats happened to all start with a C. So that's why they were called the C-Class. And they're all sort of class, classically Greek and Latin names, aren't they, which I can never pronounce and... Uh, not all, but mostly. Yeah. Why is it the one I always look at has got some ridiculous name? Don't they? Sorry, that, that's years of being tortured with Latin at school and can't remember, can't remember a damn bit of it. Well, um, you know, the classics were much more important back then than they are today. And yeah. I guess it was a sign of uh, education. Mm, some oik going to <laughs> South London comprehensive. It's it, not, not so much. Um, so w one of the interesting things when... I know when, when we chatted about this was the the involvement of the Australian government in the order for the the flying boats and and also the uh, quite quite rightly the desire to ensure that especially their chunk of the route would have an Australian airline flying it as well so it wasn't just going to be the British are coming Qantas what then turns out to be Qantas would be flying it as well. So how do the Australian government get involved in the requirements process and the order process for the C-Class boats? Well, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> so I mentioned before that Imperial Airways had come up with this idea for the Empire Air Mail scheme back in 1934, just as the international service to Australia was getting underway, and the first iteration of it. And... <clears throat> There were negotiations behind the scenes between Imperial Airways and the British government for a while about it, and news leaked out, in fact, of this proposal before the Australian government had even been consulted about it. So I think the Australian government got their nose out of joint a bit right from the word go, but um, it was more to it than that. So there were a couple of factors. One was that in Australia... Uh, I mentioned the early airmail contracts, and that had been sort of expanded over the years. As well as that, uh, the Australian government had put a lot of money into developing aerodromes to service those routes um, because they were responsible for that part of the deal. And also, Australia back then was pretty sparsely settled by white people. Uh, there was, was a huge continent. It still is a huge continent and still fairly sparsely settled in many areas, but even then, uh, back then, it was even more sparsely settled. And <clears throat> defence of the continent was considered to be a, a high priority. And the Defence Department could see that aircraft offered a way of rapidly reinforcing areas and so on. So the whole initial government funding of the uh, civil aviation infrastructure was actually had a defence purpose as well, and the idea being if we have all these aerodromes, we can fly you know, troops or whatever we need to around the country and so on. So a lot of money had been sunk into doing that um, up into the 30s, uh, and they were all land planes. Of course, Australia is also a very arid continent, so there wasn't a lot of water in the interior anyway to operate flying boats and so on. So um, when the British government did approach Australia about coming into this flying boat scheme, and I haven't really talked about why Imperial Airways settled on flying boats, so that's probably a good point to talk about that as well. Mm, definitely. So there are really three reasons why they chose flying boats. Well, before I talk about those three reasons, one of the other factors was that they had been operating uh, on the existing uh, air route, flying boats between uh, Italy and Alexandria in Egypt across the Mediterranean and flying boats, they'd gained some experience of operating flying boats in that environment and flying boats were considered to be safer. So that was one of the first 
reasons why they went for the flying boats. So the reason that there was a lot of water around the empire and flying boats were safer because if you had an engine fire and engines weren't anywhere near as reliable as they are today, uh, you could land your flying boat on the sea and everybody would be okay. They could come and be picked up or whatever. So that, that was the first thing. It was the safety side of things. And that's why they they were using them on the Mediterranean. They'd got some experience in that and that, that was their rationale. The next thing was throughout the empire, including Australia, uh, aerodromes were few and far between, and the ones that were there were pretty undeveloped, especially down through Africa and, and through a lot of Asia. To introduce larger, faster, more modern aircraft, obviously going to need bigger aerodromes, better surfaces, and all that sort of thing, there would be a huge expenditure required in setting up or improving aerodromes. So a lot of the aerodromes in those early days, they became very boggy in winter. A lot of them were quite confined, so they would have had to have been enlarged and so on. So big investment required in aerodromes. And if you had a flying boat, they reckon tons of water around the empire. Again, we can easily find places uh, to operate big new flying boats um, and we won't have to spend anywhere near as much money on aerodromes and the third factor that they thought was uh, important was if you had all your aerodromes on the coast because that's where your water was then fuel costs would be a lot cheaper and bear in mind back in those days transport wasn't what it is today so freighting fuel around was an expensive business it had to be shipped into a port put on a train taken by train to wherever the airport was maybe trapped to the actual airport and so on but if you could just get your fuel at the port, it would be a hell of a lot cheaper. So they were the three key reasons why Imperial Airways wanted to go with flying boats. So the Australian government, though, looked at that and they went, well, we've already invested a lot of money in land aerodromes, so we don't, we don't want that investment to go into the bin. And besides, we still need the aerodromes for defence purposes. We don't have any flying boat bases. There's no water in the inland of Australia, so any flying boat route would have to go around the coast. Um, particularly across northern Australia, the coast was very uh, sparsely settled, so there was no economic reason to do that. There weren't going to be passengers or anything like that using the service uh, or not anywhere near to the same degree that there would be from, say, the capital cities. Um, and uh, so the Australian government was kind of faced with um, uh, a double-edged problem that they would have to invest money in setting up flying boat bases, but they would also have to still keep financing their land aerodromes as well. Um, the other problem was that the way the Australian government had been financing civil aviation was through surcharges on airmail, and the Empire Airmail Scheme proposed taking the surcharge off the email to generate the increased volume. But domestically, there wasn't enough, there was never going to be enough volume to make that work for internal services. So they, the government looked at it and said, well, if we take the surcharge off the external emails, it's going to cost more to send a letter from Melbourne to Sydney than it would to send a letter from Sydney to London, which was obviously a ridiculous situation. So. For all of those reasons, the Australian government looked at it and went, no, we don't want to have a, a part of any of this. And in 1936, they rejected the participation in the Empire ML scheme, much to the shock of the British government. And that kind of set off a political round robin for a while where uh, the British were trying to throw in sweeteners to get the Australian government to come on board with the scheme because... From a British point of view, their idea was they wanted to connect the empire and Australia was an important part of the empire in those days. And if Australia wasn't going to be part of their big scheme, then that wouldn't look very good. So there was a lot riding on convincing Australia to take part. So there's a lot of similarities with Australia and Canada in the self-determination of, of the country. It's not as, you know, sort of kowtowing to, to London as as people think, they're both very similar in the, the autonomous way that they operated. So I, I guess 
you have the, the typical British, we have this idea, this is going to be a thing. And it's like, sorry, mate, no, it, that would have put spanners in it. But in the end, it they also come around to it. And I guess the, there's there's a compromise, isn't there, Breach, to, to allow the service to, to kick off? Yep, that's exactly what uh, happened. So there were a couple of compromises. One of them was on the surcharge. So the agreement that they reached in the end was that Australia could keep a surcharge on mails, on emails out of Australia, but the British would take the surcharge off emails coming into Australia, which, and then Australia could keep the, um, the surcharge for Australian originated mails. So that was one uh, answer to the thing. The other one was that the Australian government convinced the British government to subsidise the funding of the infrastructure required to build these flying boat bases around Australia. And they're a whole another subject of discussion because, um, as I said, a lot of Australia was extremely remote back then. I was trying to think of it as a bit like being sent to Mars for a while or sent up to the moon, you know. It was kind of that level of being cut off from society if you lived in some of those really remote places and that north coast of Australia between sort of Darwin and across to the east coast back in the 30s was very sparsely populated particularly by white people white people didn't think a lot about Aborigines back then unfortunately so they would have to build flying boat bases to service the aeroplanes because the aeroplanes only had a very short range as we talked about earlier on Um, so they would have to stop fairly frequently on their way from Darwin down to Sydney, which was chosen as the, the terminus of the route. And that meant that, as I said, they'd have to put up these flying boat bases. So each of the bases, particularly two across the north of Australia in the Gulf of Carpentaria, um, there was one at Groot Island and one at Corumba. Um, they were basically little towns that they had to build. So they had about 10 or 12 people permanently based there. So you had accommodation and messing and radio facilities and all the rest of it. And boats, of course, because the flying boat, you can only get to by boat. So they had refuelers and refueling boats. You had a control launch and an auxiliary launch. You had boatmen to drive the boats. So it was a huge operation. And we're only talking about three services a week in each direction. So six flights in a week. So, you know. Very, very few movements uh, and a huge expense. Because even with just three, three a week, you're going to each way, you're going to be looking at a huge amount of fuel that you're going to need because these are, these are big, thirsty aircraft. So you're essentially building massive fuel storage depots in the middle of nowhere. Correct. That's exactly what happened. They um, built huge fuel tanks and in the Gulf, they would get a ship in twice a year from uh, usually the Netherlands East Indies where they were producing petroleum. Uh, Shell would sail a tanker down and um, they would pump fuel into the tank enough to last for six months. But, yeah, of course, all of that had to be shipped in, all the, the steel from the tanks, and it was assembled on site. You know, huge logistical problem. Uh, and so part of the deal that was reached, as I said, was that the Australian government got the British government to fund most of that. And uh, it turned out that the costs were actually a lot higher than had been anticipated. And the British government was on the hook for it. I'm shocked. Yeah, I oh, know. <laughs> what a surprise. That's right. But it's, the whole... Just, 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 just before we jump on, because yeah, the, the thing we haven't mentioned is <laughs> airplanes don't like salt water. So it's... No. We sort of think of we think of flying boats as boats, basically, but <laughs> they're really not because we're talking about fuel stops. But then you also have to have the ability to get them out of the water to make sure that they're there. So it's you're not essentially just building a a port, are you? An airport in the literal sense of it. You're you're having to be able to have all the facilities for getting this massive thing out of the water which doesn't have its own wheels the maintenance of it as well that's going to be done at each of these places there's a lot of factors that go into these places which i guess is why they they ended up costing so much money that's true except that 
surprisingly, for the first year, there was no slipway. No, sorry, not the first year. For about the first six months, there was no slipway east of Singapore. So, oh wow! Yeah, surprise. When I found that out, I was quite surprised as well. There's no way to get one of these airplanes out of the water east of Singapore. So, in Singapore, in uh, about thirty. Five or six, I can't remember the exact date, but um, they built a new uh, airport at Kalang. So previously, uh, civil aircraft had used the RAF base at Salita, but uh, they built a new airport at Kalang, on, uh, which is on the south coast of Singapore, closer to the, the city, based on uh, reclaimed land. But as was the fashion in the 30s, it was a combined land and water aerodrome. So it did have a slipway and hangars and so on where you could haul the, the flying boats out. And in fact, that's exactly what they did. The flying boats normally slipped the service in Singapore. So none of these bases that I'm talking about had a slipway. The only slipway was built at Rose Bay and that didn't come into use until I think about six months after the service opened. And, and even then there wasn't a hangar there for a year after it opened. So all the maintenance, in the early days, the maintenance all had to be done on the water. And even when they could pull it out of the water at the start, there was no hanging to put it in. So it, it was all done out in the open. So pretty poor conditions, we would think, today. But, uh, you know, they, they made it. But I'm really surprised that they never needed to pull airplanes out of the water elsewhere. But one of the advanced or interesting features of the S-23, in fact, I didn't mention, was it was designed with so that the leading edges of the wings could fold down and they would form a work platform so you could stand on them and work on the engines or whatever. And there was a provision for a derrick that you could put on top of the engine nacelle to lower an engine out if you had to change an engine. So you'd, you'd come out with a boat, lower the engine into the boat, take it away, bring out the replacement engine and hoist that up using the derrick into place and then fit it in all, you know, sitting out over the water. And of course, you know, anything you drop is just going to go splash and down to the bottom. So uh, there was a fair bit of that. People used to tie all their tools, you know, the engineers used to tie their tools onto them with bits of string and uh, so on. So if they accidentally dropped it, they could retrieve it. And um, I even had, uh, in some places, they had little magnets that you could lower down on a on a bit of string into the water to fish around for your tool if you dropped it. So, yeah, it was pretty rough conditions, we would think, today, but uh, you know, that's the way it was back then. In our notes, you've got the Saga flying boat base site <laughs> selection, because you, 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 you very casually threw in a few few names, but... It was not easy picking these places ac across northern Australia. No. It was, again, unless you've had the privilege of going to Australia, and it is a privilege, it's a fantastic place because you get to meet <laughs> wonderful people while you're there. It's really big. Even when you're cutting across the bottom, it's it's still good good four hours in a modern plane. But when you're going across the top of the plane, but these are massive distances over very rugged jungly terrain isn't it so how did how did they pick the spots for the, the main bases yeah well you're absolutely right i mean just on the australian section of the route to get from sydney to darwin was three days in the flying boat so you know it was a long trip just to get out of australia uh, so it was a huge problem and as i said australia very arid interior so not a lot of water nowhere to land big flying boats that's for sure so they had to come around the coast, and they ended up, uh, they did six different surveys to find suitable places, and it was quite touch and go for a while as to whether, in fact, they would find um, suitable sites. And the, the first survey started in 1935, was done by the RWF, the Australian Air Force. They sent a seagull flying boat out of Point Cook in Melbourne, and the instructions were to survey the coast for places for, to set up flying boat bases. And um, Arthur Hempel was in, in command of the aircraft. He was sent off. They didn't even have any kind of specification for what this new flying boat was going to be at the time. 
or what kind of flying boat basically was actually looking for. I just sent him off and went, go and find a place. I'll go and find places. Anyway, Hempel trotted it off and I waited to boy with the entire story, but it was a huge saga. It was supposed to take, I think, three months from memory, but it ended up taking something like about seven months by the time he got back to Point Cook because he ended up diverting up into New Guinea and then people got sick and then they had engine failures. They had about five engine failures. They had to do engine changes two or three times. And, of course, they had to wait for an engine to be shipped around to the airplane. So it was a huge saga. And Hempel really didn't produce the information that the Civil Aviation Branch was looking for. He only received the specification for the aeroplane with some of its performance figures by the time he'd already got to Brisbane, I think. And he didn't get the specification for the flying boat bases until he'd already passed Darwin. And the Air Force said, oh, you're up at, up at Darwin, you might as well keep going, keep going around the other side of Australia and come back that way. So poor old Arthur Hempel was not best pleased by the time he got back to Melbourne and he harassing him about his report for a while. And after he got back to Melbourne, he wrote up his final report and he, he wrote in it, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here, but he said, uh, sites for a flying boat route around Australia in accordance with the specification cannot be found. And that was his conclusion. And it turned out that the specification for the flying boat bases was a pretty wildly optimistic thing. It required a 2,000 yard run in any direction, plus obstacle free gradients in every direction as well. I think it was one in 15 slope or something. So, you know, there's probably no place in the world that would have met that kind of a standard. You couldn't have a sea more than two and a half feet high, even though Hempel had been operating his old seagull uh, in seas higher than that. So you know, it was just a, a pie in the sky type of specification. But, but he, he wrote his report based around that and said, "Well, he wrote. He said you can you know, here's the suitable flying boat base sites here, there, and wherever. But there's no site that meets the, the specification you sent me. Um, so there was a lot riding on it all by then, of course, because the British were committed to the Empire Email scheme by this time." Qantas were right behind it because uh, they were pretty close to Imperial Airways and Imperial Airways were obviously driving it all. Um, uh, but the Australian government, um, particularly the Civil Aviation Branch and the Air Force, they weren't behind it. And I think they seized on Hibble's report and went, oh, see, here, there's no way we can do this. So that, as I said, created some political shockwaves and... The British government then wrote to the Australian government, paraphrasing again, but we don't really like the conclusion that your man came up with. We want to send our own bloke out, which the Australian government agreed to. <laughs> so British governments, through Imperial Airways, sent out Herbert Brackley to Australia, and he was Imperial Airways, uh, for what, he, what he's told, he was superintendent of something or other. But he was responsible for a lot of their development work, and he was a management person in Imperial Airways, but he was no you know, chairborne warrior. He was a hands-on man. He flew all the aeroplanes himself. He did a lot of the development flying for new aircraft as they came into the fleet and so on. And he, I think he was superintendent of technical development or something like that. Um, the short Mayo composite, which you, I'm sure you're aware mm -hmm. of, the piggyback aircraft, um, he did a lot of the development flying and that, I think, um, and so on. So he knew his onions, of Brackley. Anyway, he came out. The Royal Air Force provided a Singapore flying boat in Singapore from one of the squadrons there. And uh, Hudson Fish, who was the managing director of Qantas, flew up to Singapore and he joined it. And then in Darwin, when they got down here, oh, they, they surveyed through the Netherlands East Indies. That was another kind of a question mark on the route as well that no one had really looked at. Uh, and the whole saga with the Dutch is a whole other story again. But um, uh, when I got to Darwin, uh, some people from the civil aviation branch joined the survey as well. And so they they went across the Gulf of Carpentaria and then down the east coast of Australia to Sydney looking for flying boat based sites. And because Brackley uh, was much more familiar with the Empire flying boats, 
and also a quite experienced pilot himself, he was able to say, well, you know, this might not meet the specification, but it'll be okay for a base site. But even so, they still couldn't identify a site in the western Gulf of Carpentaria, which is a big chunk out on the top of Australia, where you could locate a base site. They looked at uh, a couple of sites when they were there, but um, none of them were really very satisfactory. So if, even after that, there was still a big question mark over whether you could, in fact, find a site that would enable the route to, to come through. So Brackley turned around and flew back again and did some more surveying on his way back, put in his report. He said, it's all great, except there's a big question mark on the, the Gulf of Carpentaria. So then there were another couple of surveys launched, including by ship into the Gulf of Carpentaria to look for base sites. So on the eastern side, um, Carumba had been identified. It's a little uh, port at the mouth of the Norman River. And in the 30s, there was no permanent white population there. There was a meat packing uh, place. So in the dry season, this is all the tropics, of course, uh, in the dry season, uh, they would drive cattle in and kill them and then pack them on, on uh, refrigerate them and ship the, the meat out overseas. That was just a seasonal thing. And beyond that, the only permanent population, I think, were just a couple of people who lived there Maybe you had a farm and there was a pilot station, not an aeroplane pilot, a sea pilot station uh, at the mouth of the river. So very remote, unsettled, but the river actually did a sort of a right angle bend. So they worked out you could get two alighting runs and that would be good enough for most of the expected wind conditions there. So Karumba was settled on fairly early as a, as a site for a base, but on the Western Gulf, they had a lot of trouble finding it. Um, the, uh, so that after Brackley's survey, the Navy got sent, uh, told to send their survey ship, HMAS Moresby, up there to have a look around and see what they could find. And uh, they came across a chap who was a, I think he was some kind of a religious minister. And anyway, he'd been working on Groot Island, which was an Aboriginal reserve in those days. So uh, that in the late 30s, we had a policy in Australia of um, with the Aborigines, the, the, the Indigenous population. Basically, uh, if you had any kind of white uh, blood, so if you were a half-caste of any kind, then the idea was that we would try and turn you into a white person. And for uh, Aborigines that were still living a native lifestyle, their original traditional lifestyle, we would kind of cordon them off and prevent any white people from having any contact with them because experience had shown that, you know, white people bought things like disease and also alcohol and so on, and it corrupted their way of living. So the idea was to allow them to try and live their traditional lifestyle without any interference from white people. So consequently, uh, Aboriginal reserves were created where white people weren't allowed to go unless they had special permission. So anyway, it turned out this uh, chap, uh, Groot Island was an Aboriginal reserve mm -hmm. back then, and this chap had been working with the uh, Aborigines and he knew of a lake. Strangely enough, in fact, it might have been, I said you could be hard-pressed to find the perfect flying boat site that met all the specs, but... Good old, it probably did. It might have been the only place in the whole network that did actually meet those specifications. There was a little lake, a landlocked lake, or northeastern side of Good Island, and he said, I think that would make a perfect place for a flying bad base. So HMAS Moresby had a walrus on a seagull, actually, which is the, the predecessor of the walrus. So she immediately launched the seagull up to uh, Groot Island to go and have a look, and they flew over it and went, yep, this is the place we're looking for, and quickly settled on uh, Groot Island. So then Moresby went back later on again with a survey team, and they actually did some survey work there and checked it and so on, but decided that that was where they were going to build the base. But uh, once again, incredibly remote part of the world back in the, the late 30s. I'm looking at it on Google Maps. It looks like it's a pretty remote place now. Still very remote. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 
still very remote, but a lot, a lot more remote back then. And uh, the other thing was, they'd all been out doing all this survey work. <laughs> what no one seems to have realised at the time was, because it was an Aboriginal reserve, they actually weren't allowed to be on the island. So they sort of just kind of overlooked that at the time. And then it wasn't until later on that it was pointed out that this was a reserve because they were trying to get rights to use the land. And they ended up having to excise part of the island from the uh, Aboriginal reserve um, for the flying boat base. So the air mail schemes inaugurated in 1934. When do services both ways, I suppose, actually start? So the Empire Airmail Scheme, or as it became known in the UK, it was always called the Empire Airmail Scheme here, but in the UK it became formally known as the Empire Airmail Program. So that actually started, it operated in stages. So as basically as the flying boats were came online, which so uh, they started in, uh, oh, the first one flew in late 36, but the Imperial Airways really didn't start using them until 1937. So as more aircraft came online, Imperial Airways sort of gradually pushed out the, the flying boats. And along with that came the introduction of the Empire ML scheme. So the first sections of the route that they were used on was on the Mediterranean. So they basically re replaced the old Calcutta's that they had been using. And then they linked the Mediterranean back to the UK, so through France and uh, Italy, and then pushed out from Alexandria, firstly down towards uh, South Africa, so in sort of um, stages that way, and then out to India, first to Karachi, then to Calcutta, and then further out into Burma, uh, Malaya, and then well, Malaya and Singapore and then finally out to Australia. And the idea was eventually to join New Zealand into the scheme as well. So the first stage was uh, the UK to Africa. The second stage went out to the east, to India, and then further. And then the third stage was introducing the, the flying boats all the way through to Australia, along with the reduced surcharge. So that occurred over 1937-38. In hindsight, the route doesn't run for a particularly long time here, but was it particularly successful for what they wanted to achieve, getting the getting the mail out and the odd passenger too? I think it was. You know, if you look at the mail figures, once they took the surcharge off the mail, the volume of mail that they were shifting just increased enormously. Um, economically, I'm not fully certain about the economics of it, Depends on how you factor it, particularly if you take into account the infrastructure costs of you know, building the flying boat bases. So in Africa, they had to do some of that as well, but not to anywhere near the extent that they did out uh, to Australia because of Africa was sort of much more developed. You know, there's more cities and mm -hmm. ports and things that they, they were able to use. Yeah, but certainly in terms of the volume of mail, uh, it was a great success. And as I said, in the Christmas of 1938, the whole thing just about collapsed under the weight of, of the mail, which, you know, says something about it. Um, and that was even after they'd made quite extensive preparations because they knew it was coming. They could see it coming. In fact, in, 19, in Christmas 1937, they'd had a similar experience, but Australia wasn't in on the Emma, Empire Emile scheme, then it was only Africa, and they'd, they'd just about gone under then as well. But in 1938, they could see this coming over the horizon, and, and they made quite extensive uh, plans to deal with it, and they still almost went under. <laughs> That's laid plans collapse under the weight of yeah. people sending a Christmas card. They also lost a couple of aircraft, which didn't help. <laughs> no, that is. <laughs> There's that as well, because it's it's still that sort of cutting edge of of aviation at the time. But yeah. it's the Qantas Imperial split is interesting because we start getting into law here because I guess there's there isn't really a natural handover point because you then get Imperial crews flying Qantas aircraft and vice versa. It's a very modern 
way of of making the operation work, but it makes it very difficult from a sort of legal and maintenance perspective because it's not this is our stuff, these are our people anymore. You have the beginning of third party maintenance and third party operation. Yeah, we haven't really talked about that aspect of it, but in the final agreement that was reached between the Australian and British governments for the operation of the system, the British government insisted that all maintenance on the aircraft would be done in Britain and that the aircraft would run the entire length of the the route down to Australia and back. Because the Australian government, I went to Coon on that idea and in fact Qantas eventually got permission to build an engine overhaul shop in Sydney, which as it turned out when the war came along uh, was a very fortuitous thing, but that's a side issue for the moment. Um, <clears throat> so the Australian government insisted that Qantas should own a number of the flying boats in, in proportion to the total route mileage. Um, so it worked out that uh, Qantas would get six of the flying boats uh, and they would be owned by Qantas. And the Australian government wanted those six aircraft owned by Qantas because in the event of a military emergency, they wanted to be able to say, uh, requisition those aircraft into military service, and they, they could do that if they were Australian-owned. But if Imperial Airways owned them, obviously they couldn't do that. However, the British government wanted all the maintenance to be done in, in Britain because they said, this is where they build, we've got all the technical facilities, and blah, blah, blah. It's going to be a lot cheaper if we do that. So this, the compromise that they came up with was that the aeroplanes would go all the way to Australia and back, and because you would need more than six to do all that, we would see uh, British registered aeroplanes all out in Australia, as well as Australian registered ones. And you would see Australian registered aeroplanes in Britain instead of British ones. But in 1919, the international community had agreed on the Paris Convention on Civil Aviation, which uh, created an organisation called ICANN, the International Commission on Aerial Navigation. And they were empowered to set rules for international aircraft operations. So they were a forerunner, I guess, of uh, of ICAO that we have today. So early on in the piece, ICANN came up with some rules for uh, operating aeroplanes. One of them was one of the key rules, and it's still the rule today, is that aeroplanes have a nationality. So like a ship does, the same thing applied to aeroplanes. So you would have aeroplanes uh, registered in their home country and they would have the nationality of that country. To operate an aeroplane, you would have to have a license to fly the aeroplane issued by the country of registration. So if the aeroplane is registered in Australia to fly it, technically you'd have an Australian pilot's license. Or if it's registered in the UK, you'd have a UK pilot's license. Okay, so now we've got the Empire Email scheme that says, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to interchange all those aeroplanes um, between the two airlines. So Qantas were still going to operate to fly the aeroplanes. The Qantas pilots, crews, would fly the aeroplane from Sydney to Singapore and uh, Imperial Airways from Singapore to Britain and back. So the crews would swap, but the aeroplanes wouldn't. So that means we could have a Qantas crew flying a British registered aeroplane or an Imperial Airways crew flying an Australian registered aeroplane. So under international regulations, that's not allowed. <laughs> right, so we seem to have just ignored that particular problem. I'm not quite sure how, why I've never found any files uh, explaining how they got around that, other than perhaps because um, we're all considered part of the British Empire, but um, that might have been how they justified it, or probably was how they justified it. So on top of that, we've got the problem of uh, all the maintenance being done in the UK. So similarly to crews, you can't maintain an aeroplane unless you have a license to maintain aeroplanes issued by the state of registry. But here we had Qantas aeroplanes being maintained in Britain uh, by British engineers with British licences. So once again, completely outside of the whole ICANN framework. So that was one of the issues, that, and it took them about a year to grapple with that because 
when the government had agreed on this is how the service was going to work, it seems like nobody had ever actually considered the practicality of what the implications of it would be in terms of, you know, licensing and all that sort of thing. So it's all complicated further by the Imperial Airways maintenance practices. So in the 30s up to this point, or and prior, uh, certificate of registration for the aircraft had to be renewed every 12 months. Sorry, certificate of airworthiness, I should say. So these days we don't do that. These days we have a permanent certificate of airworthiness and then the aircraft has some kind of a maintenance release that releases it, which says it's it's still airworthy to fly. But in those days you had a certificate of airworthiness and they had to be renewed every 12 months. And the way you did it, up to this point was you took it into the hangar, you pulled it apart, inspected everything, replaced the bits that noted replacing, put it all back together and reissued the certificate of airworthiness. Um, now, Imperial Airways adopted a new system of maintenance for the Empire flying boats that significantly complicated all of that, but made things... Um, a lot more efficient in some other ways. So what they did, and they, this was, as far as I can see, this was the first time this was ever adopted. This is actually the way we maintain a lot of aeroplanes today. So instead of taking the aeroplane into the hangar once a year, they, they reasoned if you had to do that with an aeroplane like the Empire Flying Boat, it would take you two or three weeks offline to strip it all down, do all the maintenance, put it back together. Right? So the aeroplane would be out of service for two or three weeks every year. Right, so quite a significant economic impact. So what they, the system that they adopted was they decided they would do every time the aeroplane came back to Southampton, uh, it would be there for a week or so before it went out again on another service. And in that week, they would do some of the maintenance required on a rolling basis. So over the over the twelve months, they would maintain everything and inspect everything that they had to inspect for a C of A renewal, um, but it wouldn't all be done in one hit. It would be done a bit by bit by bit. So the problem with that is you have to keep track of what you've maintained and serviced as you go along. So every component, every significant component in the aeroplane had its own identity and job tracking system. So they kept control of all of this. They had a huge card file system, right? No computers back then, of course. Um, so it was all written on cards and bits of paper. And every time somebody did some work on something, they would write a little chit and then send that in. And then that would get recorded on the aircraft's records. And ideally, by the end of the 12 months, everything would have been done. And the airplane could just be, have its CVA renewed and be sent back out without having to spend time in the hangar. So this, as I said, this is actually quite a modern way of doing moments. This is the way we maintain airplanes today. But um, at the time, it was very um, innovative, we'll say, uh, also very complex. It's difficult enough keeping <laughs> track of these things on, on modern computerized systems with, with these things going on, and let alone card files. To be fair, probably the card files work better, thinking about it, having, <laughs> having dealt with... <laughs> Maybe, yeah, that's right. Uh, one of the other problems, of course, with that system was that there was inevitably some maintenance that had to be done down the route somewhere, you know, something would break and they'd have to replace it or whatever. So somebody down, down route would have to fill in the chit and send it back with the aeroplane so that it could be updated. You know? So you had bits of paper all over the place going backwards and forwards. And also with the corner boats, the Australian government said, no, no, if they're going to be registered in Australia, Qantas, you're responsible for all the paperwork. Um, even though Qantas wasn't doing most of the work. So they, it took them, as I said, about a year to sort all of this out. And, well, how are we going to do that? How are we going to try, keep track of stuff that we, we're not even dealing with? So that's how it worked. You know, every time in the UK there was work done on an Australian aeroplane, somebody would write the chit. And in, in the, rear, the other direction, it would come out to Australia where they could write it into the aircraft's logbooks or whatever. So even though Imperial Airways was keeping track of the maintenance and doing the, the overhauls and all the rest of it, 
court has still had to duplicate all that, that paperwork out here for the Australian authorities because the Australian authorities had to issue the CMA renewal. So uh, a hugely complex system. When I first found out about this, I just about wanted to tear my hair out. But it, it's laying the groundwork for the systems that we take for granted today, isn't it? It's in in a lot of ways, it it's literally cutting edge because it's yeah, figuring it these things out and making them work and ensuring the legal standards are in place. Yep, exactly. I mean, another example of that is um, Imperial Airways did all their engine overhauls at a subsidiary company in Croydon, and normally an engine certainly up to that point, an engine had an identity, serial number, whatever, whatever, and all the parts of that engine fell within that identity. But um, with the Pegasus engines in the Empire boats, Imperial operated on a, or just decided to operate a different way. Um, when they stripped an engine down, they would inspect all the, the bits of the engine and anything that was serviceable by put into a big bin of parts. So uh, it no longer had the identity of the engine that it came out of, it was just sitting in a bin. And when they built an engine up, they would just pull out whatever parts they needed from the bin um, and put them into a new engine. So that meant that you could have components of different ages in, in one engine. There was no way to... Um, yeah, you couldn't just say that engine is is that engine. And it was an engine made up of a whole range of different parts of them that had different origins, different times in service, all the rest of it. But each of those had to be tracked because all of those parts have life limits and all the rest of it that had to be kept track of. So you could have an engine that might have you know a thousand hours to run on some parts, but only two hundred hours to run on other parts. You know, quite a complex kind of system. Once again, mm. that's how we do stuff to pay but um, back then it was very very uh, innovative and unusual innovative unusual yet what we're used to now and i suppose it's you wouldn't think it being that structured then but it makes perfect sense that that it was and you've got very clever people at at imperial and other other airlines as well, working these things out to ensure that it's done reasonably and cheaply as well to, to make sure that profitability stays in place. You're absolutely right about that. And the economics of it all was always on the mind of Imperial Airways and Qantas um, because they are being financed basically by the, the governments. It was always a focus on doing things as cheap as possible. Phil's great, isn't he? And in the second half of our conversation, we're going to look at what happened when war broke out and the service to London was severed. And interestingly, the competition that continued in Southeast Asia with KLM and Dai Nippon Koku, which was the Imperial Japanese Airways, as war simmered over there. And then, of course, what happened when the Japanese stormed south in the late 1941. If you'd like to know more about what we've been chatting about, Phil's written some incredible articles for The Aviation Historian, which is a superb quarterly magazine who've been mad enough to even let me write for them. So I popped the link to them in the description. And Phil's back issues, if you want to have a look, are in TAH9, TAH17, TAH30, and 31. So that's all flying boat goodness all the time. And seriously, if you can get a chance, subscribe the aviation historian they're fantastic so if you're in melbourne definitely get to the airways museum and have a look around a lot of the stuff i recognize from my days in ops because when i started we used some old kit but it's all about navigational aids what goes into making an airline work from those on the ground as always got to thank the sponsors at the pima air and space museum i know i've just been picking up a different museum but they're fantastic Links, as usual, to them and Titan and everybody out there in Tucson. Check them out. They've got lots of cool stuff going on. Tell your friends all that usual jazz. So until next time, please do take care of yourselves. And thank you ever so much for your continued support. 
The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Buck, and it is a Boney Abroad's podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to Boney Abroad.